Good evening and welcome to our Zachariah study. It's been seven months. Those months are filled with miracles and I know a lot of you have asked about my condition so I don't want to talk a lot about myself. I really want to do this study and in the news but let me give you an update for those of you who had asked and thank you for all your prayers. I want you to know that that's what's gotten me here so far. It's been one miracle after another. I went into a coma on February 3rd, stayed there for six months. I was intubated and a series of miracles, which I'm sure over the course of our studies you'll hear. Um, right now, I'm at a spot where I have my toes amputated on my right foot uh, because basically what happened was they gave me uh, some drugs, some, some uh, medicine to pull the blood from my extremities to my heart, my lungs, and my brain when my pulse went down to about 40. And so that made my toes necrotic. So I had to get my first amputation about three weeks ago and I'm healing fine. It'll take six weeks fully for me to be back on it. Then once that happens, I'll have to get my other five toes removed and uh, then I'll wait another six weeks and we'll go to MD Anderson to complete my CAR T therapy. So there's been hurdle after hurdle, but God has been so faithful through your prayers. And I want to thank you for all that. I'm sorry that that's a short summary of what's happened to me, but I really do want to speak the word of God tonight. Let me start within the news. Obviously in the last seven months, you've watched your world and you've watched the catastrophes that have happened. Our presidency is one of the worst ever. Uh, his, his approval rates are the all time low well, across all the board. <clears throat> and we can see that in his foreign and his domestic policy. Just this week, he went to Saudi Arabia and um, fist bumped the uh, crown prince of Saudi Arabia, hardly presidential. Um, there's a controversy of whether he actually brought up about the murder of a journalist and Saudi Arabia says he didn't. He said he did. So it goes for sh uh, to show that we can't really trust anything that comes out of this administration. <clears throat> Let me give you some in the news just from this last week. Biden policy on China in disarray has become the greatest geostrategic threat. So less than 48 hours after United States and British intelligence off officials called or in, called a rising China the most game-changing challenge we face, quote-unquote. President Joe Biden stood poised to remove tariffs from the Chinese products, uh, while doubling down on plans to foist controversial social engineering policies on the U.S. military. So Biden has opened up a friendly rapport with China and giving them pretty much a green light. On Wednesday, uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray and the leader of the U.K.'s MI5, his name is Ken McCollum, warned that, quote, the Chinese Communist Party presents most pressing geostrategic and economic threat that the West has ever faced. The Chinese government is set on stealing our technology and using it to undercut our businesses and dominate our markets, said Ray in London. But observers say that Biden administration and their actions cut the legs out from under Ray's rhetoric. On the one hand, you have the FBI director, Ray, saying this, but on the other hand, Biden shut down the China Initiative, which was a concerted program that Trump administration put in place to go after these professors, these researchers, these businessmen that are infiltrating our businesses at the direction of the Chinese Communist Party. It seems that Biden just wants to undo everything Trump did, regardless of how it affects our economy. Uh, the danger remains pal palpable as the federal grand jury indicted two members of the Department of Homeland Security for aiding Chinese espionage on Friday. Chinese warplanes made an incursion into the airspace of Taiwan. A U.S. Senator Rick Scott from Florida uh, visited the island and G a Chinese General Yu Zhushang told the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Mil Milley, Thursday that America must end military collision, collusion with Taiwan or they will be met with a firm counterattack from the Chinese people. Obviously, China is flexing its arms and America is doing absolutely nothing. NASA just put out a warning that the Chinese government are on track to militarize the moon. They're putting a brand new space station up in the, up in the atmosphere. They have hypersonic weapons and Chinese President Xi Jinping is telling his country when it comes to Taiwan, prepare for war, said Rep Representative Waltz, a member of the House Armed Service Committee. So what are we doing? Well, we're focus focusing on pronouns. We're focused on Pride Month. And now the Army is considering discharging and withholding pay from 60,000 soldiers. 
20% of the National Guard and the Reserves because they've been concerned over a vaccine. Walsh said in peak, in peak, the Biden administration also decreed that soldiers must show, shower with, tra with transgender enlistees who have the genitalia of the opposite sex. As the administration unveiled these new policies, military recruitment has fallen so far short, and I'll give you a report on that in a, in a, mo in a moment, of its goals that officials briefly considered eliminating the requirement to have high school diploma or a GED. We're not focused on the right things, Walt said. Meanwhile, indications are, are the president will press forward with his plan to economically reward Beijing. What the Biden administration should be doing is forcing American companies out of Chinese soil. China experts Gordon Chang told Perkins Thursday, unfortunately, President Biden has been taking actions to encourage American companies to stay in China, including telegraphing his intention to reduce tariffs. So we're watching something happen that's pretty amazing when you think about it. In short, President Biden is selling America out to China, one of our greatest enemies and our most recent threats. The next one I wanted to tell you about, and by the way, that was the chart for China, sorry, is going woke. Should we be surprised so few young adults want to serve in the U.S. military? Joe Biden and his political correct minions at the Pentagon have transformed our military into a laughing stock around the world, and that should deeply grieve every one of us. The U.S. military is one of our most important national institutions, but it continues to get weaker and weaker. According to NBC News, every single branch of our military is having trouble recruiting in 2022. A record low percentage of young Americans eligible to serve and even a tinier fraction willing to consider it. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks considered, considered the shortfall a serious issue, said the officials, and have been meeting on it frequently with other leaders. Uh, we know what they're saying is absolutely true. The Army is having the biggest problems with recruiting. At this point, the Army only recruited 40% of its goal for its fiscal year, and that's pretty bad because its fiscal year ends in September. The pool of those eligible to join the military continues to shrink with more young men and women than ever disqualified for, watch this, obesity, drug use, or criminal records. Over 23% of Americans aged 17 to 24 are qualified to serve without a waiver to join, which is down tremendously. NBC News found that only 9% of those young Americans eligible to serve in the military had any inclination to do so, the lowest number since 2007. Let me interject something here. When you continue to tear down America and you tear down its, its history and you continue to pump it into American youth, that America is not good, that it's bad, you no wonder why patriotism has gone down if you want to serve in the military. Let me continue. I think that says a lot about our society. That 77% of our young people are not even qualified to serve in the military. It's absolutely pathetic. And it's really alarming that such a low percentage of those who are actually eligible have any desire to do so. So how can we explain it? Well, there's three reasons. Number one, political correctness. Traditionally, a high percentage of military recruits came from homes that were both patriotic and conservative. But thanks to the Biden administration, the U.S. military has now become a politically correct madhouse. Marine Corps headquarters tweeted an image of a helmet sporting six rainbow-colored bullets. Air Force recruiting posted a picture of trainees running with a rainbow-striped banner instead of the stars and stripes. And in Germany, Ramstein Air Force Base sponsored their second drag queen story time for children. <clears throat> if General Patton could see this, he'd turn over in his grave. But even though our military leaders are being relentlessly ridiculed, they keep producing more cringe-inducing videos for social media. What is a self-respecting young conservative that is thinking about joining the military supposed to think when he sees something like this? Secondly, vaccine mandates. Whether you believe in vaccines or not is not the issue here. The issue is nearly needs to say the majority of those who are opposed to vaccine mandates are conservative. Conservatives traditionally make up the largest pool of military recruits. Third, war with the with Russia. The war in Ukraine has fundamentally changed how many view the United States military. In the past, 
<clears throat> serving in the military could mean dying in action. But that was mostly for personal service on the front lines in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. But if our proxy war with Russia in Ukraine becomes an actual shooting war between the two nations, it could become rapidly a nuclear conflict. And if there's a nuclear war between the United States and Russia, all of our military bases will be prime targets. If you're working on a military base and the Russians launch a surprise first strike, you will almost certainly be among the 20% of U.S. population that will instantly be wiped out during such an attack. I know that there are a lot of young people out there that have no intention of needlessly dying in a pointless war with Russia, and I can't blame them for seeing things that way. We just learned that $65 million Super Hornet was simply blown off one of our aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean Sea by bad weather. And at this point, the Navy hasn't even decided whether to go back and get the aircraft or not. You've never heard of anything like that during World War I or World War II, where our Army was in tip-top shape and our Navy was in tip-top shape and our Air Force was in tip-top shape. We are sliding, and believe me, Russia and China are going to take full advantage of it. Let me go another one for you. Let's talk about Israel for a moment. America stands with Israel for now. A new poll says the next generation is less likely to do so. A new poll, Pew Report found that 56% of U.S. youth age 18 to 29 view Israel unfavorably. And of those aged 30 to 49, the unfavorable rate is 47%. Still, the majority of Americans, 55%, view Israel favorably among those 65 and older because the 65 and olders understand what America is and was. Republicans have a high favorability rating of Israel at 71%, while 44% of Democrats hold this positive view. The Bible says, I will bless those who bless Israel, and I will curse those who curse Israel. You've heard me say that a lot and let me, in the past. And let me tell you, when we start sliding away from Israel, we're sliding away from God's promise to them, and we're sliding away from the promise of prosperity for our own nation. The survey also found that 83% of Israelis, 83% hold a favorable view of the United States and 89% see the U.S.-Israel relationship positively. Man, those statistics should tell us something about what's happening in America and our generations that are coming after us. <clears throat> Let me give you this one. Speaking of Israel, there are some amazing things going on. This one is a picture showing the third temple. The reason why is this came out this week. Crimson worm, W-R-M, die, another key element in preparing for the building of the third temple. This is exciting news. On Monday, the Temple Institute completed a study of biblical crimson dye with a practical demonstration. The study is part of an institute's ongoing red heifer, led, red heifer project led by Rabbi Yisrael Ariel and his son, Rabbi Azariah Ariel. As the crimson wool is, is a necessary element in the preparation of the ashes of the red heifer, the cow shall be burnt in his sight. Its hide, flesh, and blood shall be burned, its dung included. And the Kohen, priest, shall take the cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson dyed wool and throw them into the fire, consuming the cow. That's Numbers 10, 19, 5 to 6. The ceremony of the red heifer is one of the most mysterious and inexplicable of all the, all the ceremonies. A perfectly red heifer is slaughtered and burned entirely outside the temple. The ashes are necessarily necessary to purify Jews who have been rendered ritually impure by contact or proximity to a dead body. Though the temple service can be reinstated without the ashes of the red heifer, personal sacrifices will only be possible after the ceremony is reinstated. The dye is referred to in the Bible. It's called the Tola al-Shani. The term is usually translated as crimson wool, but the actual term refers to the insect, which is the source of the dye. The dye produces a unique shade of red used in the temple curtains and uh, as well as the high priest garments. In 2002, Dr. Zohar Amar of Bar Ilan University, University claimed to have verified the specific insect referred to in the Bible and even extracted some dye. The rabbinic authorities have finally confirmed his conclusions 
at the Temple Institute. The process is quite involved. In rabbinic literature, the dye is referred to as zehot, which was extracted from the body of a crimson red worm, the Kermis biblicus. In Israel, this worm can be found in the branches of the oak Quirius uh, ichthaburius, found in a few specific areas of Israel, and for approximately two weeks, only two weeks, in early spring. The females attach egg sacs to the tree and fill them with red eggs, crimson eggs. Collecting the insects is painstaking. The demonstration was carried out by Rabbi Yush Yeshua Friedman, the dean of the Mishak Yeshiva, a Torah institute that focuses on studies concerning the temple. Rabbi Friedman, who has taken a Nazarite vow and thus has long hair, is recognized as, as an expert in temple-related issues. The process begins by dissolving alum in boiling water, and then the insects are immersed in that water. The alum sets the dye and intensifies the crimson color. The wool is then immersed in the water and left to sit for about an hour. After it's removed from the water, the insects then are removed from the wool, and then the dye is applied to the wool. So what am I telling you? We talk about the third temple quite a bit. Five years ago, we couldn't tell you that there was a red heifer. Today we can, without spot or blemish. Five years ago, a year ago, a week ago, we couldn't tell you that we had the red dye wool. Today we do. So we're progressing closer and closer to everything needed for the uh, sacrifice and for the purity of the third temple. If you can't get excited about that, I don't know what you can get excited about. Let me give you another one that comes on tonight, today, as we talk about the planet. Um, another hit to food production as water resources dried up across the country. You may be hearing us in a foreign land tonight. Maybe you're hearing us in Alabama. Maybe water in your land is okay. But the truth is, there is a danger that's happening in America itself. The endless drought in the Southwest has become a full-blown national, full national emergency. If Lake Mead, Lake Powell, and the Colorado River keep drying at the rate they have been, millions, that's right, millions of Americans could soon be out without water or electricity. We're talking about Western United States, the whole of Western United States. And if those water sources get so low that they can't be used, we're going to have a major crisis on our hands. Truth is, the vast stretches of the Southwest are now starting to resemble Death Valley. Utah, the Great, Lark, Great Salt Lake, has been shrinking and the water level has plunged to the lowest ever recorded. We know the state's Department of Natural Resources, the DNR, said the water levels have sunk past the last record set in October, which had at that time set a new 170 year record. So water levels at the Great Salt Lake are expected to drop even further until fall or early winter as the West contends with an ongoing drought. Meanwhile, water levels of Lake Mead and Lake Powell continue to fall as well. We know that drought is actually one of the last day's signs. If water levels keep sinking in the months ahead, millions of Americans living in the Southwest could soon lose their main source of electricity because obviously their electricity is drawn by water. Threatening the dam's ability to generate electric electricity and provide water, you ready for this? To its nearly 40 million users. The drinking water for millions of America is also at risk. Normally, the Colorado River provides drinking water for approximately 40 million people. But now it's drying up. It's drying up really fast. And we are talking about a crisis point. This is years or even, month, this is years or even months ahead. We're talking about it right now. California and six other western states, <coughs> excuse me, have less than 60 days to pull off a seemingly impossible feat, cut a multi-way deal to dramatically reduce their con consumption of water from the dangerously low Colorado River. If they don't, federal, the federal government will do it for them. Needless to say, the endless drought is also having a massive effect on agriculture. This time of year, the wheat growing in this part of western Kansas should be thigh high and lush green, but right now, According to one farmer, it's just ankle-high straw. Most of us don't think much about our, where our food comes from, but the truth is that if farmers don't grow it, we don't get to eat it. And right now, many wheat fields in western Kansas look like barren wastelands. There was a period of time, last century, 
when we were witnessing similar things. It was called the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl days of the 1930s are a very dark chapter in American history. Now those conditions are returning. In recent years, giant dust storms have become quite common in states such as Arizona and New Mexico. But now they're starting to happen in states as far north as Iowa. A haboob is an intense dust storm, one hit near Little Rock, Iowa, this Thursday night, bringing 70 mile per hour winds and zero visibility. People were not able to see their hands in front of their face. Normally it's very rare for such a storm to ever happen in Iowa, but thanks to the endless drought, there's a tremendous amount of dust that can now be picked up and blown around. So much of our food normally grown in the Southwest, but without sufficient water, it's simply not going to be possible. So we can see some of the problems that are happening. As I continue to give you in the news, let me talk about 2022. For me, 2022 was not a very good year, but for the world, it's not been that great either. So let me show you some of the things that are happening prophetically. Tending towards the tribulation period, several indicators to watch. The apocalypse is in the air. We already see the formation of this coming new world order through the UN, the World Economic Forum. Without firing a shot, they have gained the allegiance of most world leaders for their Marxist plans to enslave the people and the world. The globalists believe they have the means to reshape our world according to their agenda via the influence they have gained over global leaders of our day. A one world governing and will be birthed once the church vacates, the players are all in place. Three words in the Bible, without natural affection, 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. That happens to a final generation. But who could have imagined today's society celebrating the trans movement, homosexual marriage, and the slaughtering of the unborn? All of these operate without natural affection. And these issues are, left, are a leftist obsession. That same passage says perilous times will come. Russia now has a lunatic leader and is threatening the world with nukes. There are more than 40 wars or serious conflicts raging in the world right now, displacing millions and often involving circumstances that are indeed perilous. Sometimes I think that we're immune to it because it hasn't happened to us yet, and I pray it doesn't, but our world is in turmoil. Our world is upside down. As Paul said, our world is groaning, ready to be delivered. Inflation and famine all prophesied to occur during Daniel's 70th week or the tribulation time, the time of Jacob's trouble. Are we not seeing the stage setting for that right now? As for food and the food apocalypse that's approaching, the poorest people will suffer as they always do. But it is feared that the pain will rapidly move up the global food chain. And we've been seeing that with empty store shelves. With that comes a surge in political turbulence, humanitarian crisis, and global instability. I don't like bringing you bad news. I don't like bringing you the troubles of our world or today. No one needs to reemphasize what our, what our news constantly plays over and over again just for their own statistics and their own viewership. I'm not trying to make this something that is horrible for us, but I am trying to alert us to the fact that we're in the last days and now is the time to get our houses in order, love our children, and really enjoy the people that are around us. Let me go on. Also in June, the soaring stock market took a nosedive and Fed Chairman Jerome Powell admitted they're looking at replacing cash with a digital currency. Let me add to this. Recession is at hand. We can't go much further as we are. And the Biden administration is totally blind or ignorant or both to these as he continues to push high programs of dollars trying to push into our economy. The man has no sense of what's happening economically. He has no sense of what's happening on a, on a physical level in America. All he is concerned about is pushing an agenda. And after his 18 cents uh, for three months is over at the gas pump, they'll surge again. And why is that? Because they want you to go green. You cannot and will not go green overnight. It's not going to happen. It would take 20 years at best to replace our combustible engines. And let me tell you something, they still wouldn't do it. So basically, we're watching someone who is playing Russian roulette with our economy, our food, our, our farm policy, and everything else. You couldn't have written a worse scenario for a president. No wonder why his administration and his approval ratings are down. 
Surely the black horse is ready to ride. T to be blunt, economies around the world are on the verge of collapse. It, I, JP Morgan Chase CEO, uh, J Jamie Dimon, is warning about a coming economic hurricane. He states, quote, right now it's kind of sunny. Things are doing okay. Everyone thinks the Fed can handle this, but that hurricane is out there, down the road, and coming our way. We don't know if it's Superstorm Sandy or Andrew, but you better brace yourself. <clears throat> Prior to this, the, we had an Adam Smith type of economy, supply and demand. That went away in the 60s when we knew that when Eisenhower and Kennedy and every president after him started to use something that was called Keynesian economics. What that meant was if supply was down or if, the, or if inflation was high, the Fed would, 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 cut the, would raise uh, interest rates. If it was low, they'd bring interest rates down like we've seen. But the Fed cannot handle what's happening right now. It will take more than just playing with the interest rates to get us out of this mess if we can get out of it. How can I not reference the raging apostasy, the wolves among the flock, the doctrine of demons, all thriving in many churches today? This sad state of church affairs may be one of the most significant signs of the times out there. A new study from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University found that just 37% of Christian pastors in America have a biblical worldview. Less than, more than 37%. It's ridiculous. Israel is sounding war drums in the face of Iran's continued development of nuclear capability. And by the way, she's almost there. Just this week, she is, she is uh, warning the world that she is capable of a nuclear weapon as they fire off intercontinental ballistic missiles at will. The Israeli Air Force has developed a new cap capability to fly its F-35 jets from Israel to Iran without requiring mid-air refueling. That is a huge boost and tells us that Israel is ready for the fight. Israeli military has upped its, prep, uh, its preparations for a strike against Iran's nuclear capabilities, a scenario possible even yet this summer. Throw into the mix the collapse of Israel's government in June. Their government is in disarray, not knowing who to, who to back as a president. The word has it that Joe Biden and his administration will do everything they can to prevent a return of Benjamin Netanyahu, one of Israel's finest leaders. And why? Because he was a buddy and he was a co-patriot with Donald Trump. The king is coming this coming any day. We are trending towards the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, and human beings cannot solve these problems. That is why the word perplexity is seen in Luke 21, 25 concerning these last days. The king of kings must return to establish his earthly kingdom on earth and to clean up the chaos, the confusion, and the consternation brought about by the Antichrist and his minions who are around right now. The stage is being set in your lifetime. The curtain for the last act could rise any day. Man, I don't know how sobering that something like that is to you, but it's extremely sobering to me. Let me give you one more on the same hand as we talk about a prophetic countdown. Netanyahu promises peace and Tom promises peace accords with multiple nations. Former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has promised to bring full peace agreements with Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries if he wins the election on the 25th Knesset this fall and forms the government. Netanyahu said, quote, I would like to express my appreciation to the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salam, for his contribution to the achievement of the four historic peace agreements we have brought, the Abraham Accords. If I return to lead the state of Israel on your behalf, I intend to bring out full peace agreements with Saudi Arabia and also with other Arab countries, Netanyahu added. While Netanyahu's return to power is far from a certainty, it does show the desire of Israeli leaders to expand the peace accords and agreements they have been begun with the several Arab nations through the Abraham Accords. Regardless who might win the upcoming elections, please listen to this with open ears. Peace with Saudi Arabia, the heart of the Sunni Muslim world, would be an amazing turn of events after continuous wars since Israel's creation. Some would call such a peace agreement even prophetic. Prophecy teachers have long warned that one of the single most important prophetic events to watch for as an indication of the start of the tribulation is the signing 
and the ratifying of a seven-year peace treaty between Israel and, quote, many nations. His prophetic period of time is detailed in the book of Daniel, as well as throughout the book of Revelation. Daniel 9.27 warns us that this specific prophetic period of time will begin when, quote, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, which it means in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed and poured out on him. So is it Netanyahu the Antichrist? Absolutely not. In his effort to bring peace to Israel, he is opening up a door that obviously the Antichrist will step through and make a seven-year peace treaty somewhere down the line. Most Bible experts agree that this is a reference to who Jesus calls the abomination that causes desolation. That's Matthew 24, 15. And he's called the beast in Revelation 13. He is most commonly known by the word Antichrist. This Antichrist figure will be a world leader. He will influence control over 10 leaders or 10 nations. He'll be a key player in bringing about a ratifying, expanding current treaties, probably the Abraham Accord. He will probably bring it to its fruition. The Antichrist figure will be exposed as the false leader that he is when he breaks that covenant halfway through uh, getting, putting a stop to sacrifice and rebuilt Jewish temple, which I just gave you an article talking about how close they are. And he will declare himself God, an abomination or desolation. A key component of this peace agreement appears to be a rebuilt Jewish temple. Could a future peace agreement provide such a temple? I've taught for it for a long time. That peace agreement, I believe, will have the Arab nations, every one of them, being able to agree with Israel as a peace. And why? Because they will agree that the temple could be rebuilt on Solomon's site, right next to the Dome of the Rock. Ezekiel tells us a wall will separate the abomination from the, from the sacred. And we are seeing something happen. So part of that peace agreement will be that Israel lays down, I believe, lays down its nuclear arms. I believe it will be that Israel will not show a standing army of what it has right now. And in, a, in response to that, the Arab nations will allow Israel to build a temple and sacrifice. To the world, it will be amazing. To the Antichrist, it will be start of his reign as he continues in that peace process to the midpoint. So, it also makes sense that such a significant treaty would have the backing of world powers to confirm or guarantee such a treaty as the word talks about. The recent statement by Netanyahu reminds us of this decree to one day reach a final peace accord. Ironically, Shiite Iran's push for a nuclear weapon is speeding up the timetable for Saudi Arabia, Israel, and other nations to come to some type of reapproachment in an effort to counter Iran's power. Whether the famous battle of Ezekiel 38 will happen before or after the start of this tribulation period remains to be seen. I, for one, believe Ezekiel 38 will happen before the tribulation. Any day, we should see nations start to flex their, flex their muscles against Israel. It would be good for you to read Ezekiel 38. It may be the next war that happens while we are yet here. But it appears the two events will be prophetically interlinked. So, what am I saying today? I'm telling you about a lot of things. I'm telling you about some of Europe's most po prominent polit politicians have argued for years that to become a true global power, the EU needs its own defense force, one that is independent of US, European, and NATO allies, and does not rely on the United States. So not only is Israel and Iran flexing their muscles, but we see the European Union, the beast, flexing its muscles. And America is last on the list. Americans, I told you, are not favoring Israel, even though Amer Israel favors America. The UN is saying we don't need America. We're watching China get to a point where they know that America probably will be very weak in the Biden administration to be able to thwart any effort of theirs to go against their Taiwan. And obviously, Putin could care less about America as he continues his needless war against the Ukraine. So we're watching some prophetic events. Have they hit us personally yet? Probably not. Other than some shelves being empty a little bit that kind of scare us and then we get over it and we go on to the next level. But the next level is not good for the world. I'm excited about the second level coming after the first, which is the return of Jesus Christ. 
I'm excited about him coming back for us because very soon he will, and I know he will. And then the world will go through one of the worst, hideous times they ever had, and then finally the great kingdom of God will come. So today, be encouraged, not by our news, but by the great news that Christ is on our side and you are on his. Tonight, I want to go right into the study of Zechariah. Let me tell you a little bit about this study. It's chapter 2, and as this gets a little long, I want you to know that at the end of this, I'm going to give one of my visions that I had while I was in a coma. I had eight of them. I'm going to give just a small part of one of them just to show you how God is in control. Zechariah chapter 2. As we see Zechariah, I want you to tell you a little bit. It's been seven months since our last Zechariah study. And obviously, you know everything we said seven months ago in our last study. Obviously, we don't. So I'm ready to start our teaching again. And I want to review Zechariah. Have we gone so far quickly? We are in the year 520 BC. As you can see from this time chart, 520 is somewhere around here where Haggai and Zechariah begin a prophetic ministry. Haggai and Zechariah are prophesying to the captive Jews in Babylon to motivate them to go to Jerusalem and to complete the Temple of Solomon, which had been destroyed 70 years earlier. We know that this is very prophetic. Zechariah, I'm amazed at to be honest with you, because I see more prophecies about the Messiah in Zechariah than I see almost anywhere else. He's considered a minor prophet, but there is so much in Zechariah, even to our day today, as I was explaining as we get through this. Haggai and Zechariah are the ones again prophesying to these Babylonian captives, the Jews that have been given an order that they can go back and return to Jerusalem. They're hesitant to do that, believe it or not. Zechariah has eight powerful visions. I've showed this to you before. He has a vision of the horsemen, the horns and the smiths, which we've already studied. I'll share it with you and go over it. And tonight, the measuring line. Then the high priest, the olive trees, the flying scrolls, the ephah, and the four chariots. And we'll continue to go on through the message of Zechariah. Not only are these visions applicable to his 6th century B.C. hearers, they are loaded with dual prophecies. And then, as I said, references to the coming Messiah, the coming tribulation, and the coming future reign of Jesus in the millennium. I'm absolutely amazed at God's word. Anyone that doesn't believe the Bible is God's word is either stupid or they've never read it because the Bible is interwoven with, with, with prophecies that dovetail each other past our very time. And so if you're a student of the Bible, as I am, and I know many of you are, then you know that the Bible proves itself over and over again. We've already again studied Zechariah's first and second vision. The first one was of the four horsemen. And you remember the picture I showed you of that? Uh, you may remember that it's about judgment. And although it's for the readers in his day, it overlaps and it intersects and it enforces uh, the future judgment of planet Earth and the four horsemen of the tribulation. You see four horsemen in Zechariah's judgment and you see four horsemen in the tribulation. That's not a coincidence. That's God reemphasizing his great plan for mankind. This first vision also includes a reference to the angel of the Lord, Tal, as an acronym, which we know as Jesus himself. The angel of the Lord appears. The Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps round about who those who fear him and delivers them. Psalm 34, 7, how true that's been for me. The angel of the Lord, powerful, majestic. I look at this, at this picture and it doesn't do justice to the power that Christ has. Then we study Zechariah's second vision of the four horns and the four craftsmen or the blacksmith. No wonder why these were so hard to interpret. No wonder why when you read your scriptures you say, what in the world is that? So as we explore it, and as you know, I take it apart and go back into all of it, it becomes clear to us, crystal clear. These four horns and these four blacksmiths, the vision represents a prophecy that four kingdoms or four horns, horns in the Bible always refer to kingdoms or kings, that will, have, that will scatter Israel, the Jews, and Jerusalem. Zechariah 1 18 and 19 says, And I said unto an angel that talked with me, he asked him right out, What are these horns? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Well, we know that horns can't scatter anyone. So obviously it's symbolic of nations or kings. These four kingdoms or kings tie back to Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. 
recorded in chapter 2 of Daniel. So we see four kingdoms, that each one of these kingdoms went against Israel, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome, each one successively defeating the one before it. So these four kingdoms or kings tie back into Daniel's vision. Four metals are associated with them of gold, silver, bronze, and iron. So you could parallel the four horns of Daniel's second vision. It's the exact same. It's the four kingdoms. Daniel, let me remind you, prophesied in 605 BC in Nebuchadnezzar's day in the reign of Babylon, the gold of the head, the gold of the image. Zechariah prophesies in 520 BC, the silver of the image, or the immediate Persian empire, which is allowing the Jews now to go back to Israel. How many of you are getting this? Raise your hands. I see all your hands out there. So in Zechariah, uh, they, both Greece, the bronze, and Rome, the iron, were future kingdoms. Both Daniel and Zechariah saw it coming roughly 600 and 500 years before it ever happened, respectively. So what about today? The Roman Empire splits in Nebuchadnezzar's image and becomes the last empire that will rule the world and eventually be taken down by a, by a stone not made of human hands, taken out of the mountain. So let me jump to today for a moment. So today, the Roman Empire is the revived Roman Empire. We know it as the European Union. I've just told you about it. Daniel prophesied about it the legs of iron that break down into the ten toes of iron and clay. Zechariah saw it as one of the four horns. So how can you not understand the, or believe the Bible when you see something written 605 B.C. and 520 B.C. that reflects where we are right now as those toes are right starting to gain promise. Now we know the European Union has 27 nations. We got excited when they had just 10 because of Bible prophecy. But... Um, the president of France right now has talked about making a new confederacy of European nations and it's getting Bible prof prophecy watchers very excited because he's talking about limiting it to 10 nations. So we're there, folks. Let me go back to Ze Zechariah. For Daniel, it was the legs of iron, as I told you. For Zechariah, it was one of the four horns in his second vision. It's the same message emphasized by God through his prophets over and over again. In the second vision of Zechariah, he sees four craftsmen next to these horns, or metal workers, blacksmiths, that will be next to those horns. These are four leaders who will punish the nations that come against Israel. They are terrifying and over, overturn the nations that oppose Israel. Look at Zechariah 1, and that's that mountain, that stone made from the mountain. Look at Zechariah 1, 20 and 21. And the Lord showed me four carpenters, actually blacksmiths. Then I said, what come these to do? He's asking direct questions. And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that man, no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, means to destroy them, to pull them apart, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lift up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. What does it mean? It means that the horns will, will, will scatter Israel. These four leaders... And these could be future leaders, we don't know, are come to break down the horns. And then it says the Gentiles were over Israel and that was a horn that was bothering them. So, in the second vision, Zechariah sees four craftsmen. Now, Zechariah and Daniel have front row seats, not only to the reality of the worlds they lived in, but to the end of the age and the world up to now that we live in. Which brings us to our study tonight in chapter 2 of Zechariah, starting with his third vision. Again, it's the, me it's the measuring line. And that is an amazing picture. A man with a measuring line. Thank you, Pastor Armand, who has created this picture. One day, Jerusalem will no longer need walls because the Lord's presence will be in her midst and the great number of people living there. Zechariah chapter 2 paints a picture of a scene of the earth after the second coming. In that day, the glory of Messiah, Christ, will be in the midst of the city. I'm giving, you a, I'm giving you a summation before I tear it apart. And the Gentile nations will be joined to Israel that day, Zechariah 2.11. This takes place in a period known as the Millennium, when Jerusalem is elevated as the capital of the earth, the city from which God rules the nations. Israel and Jerusalem will prosper, and the Gentile nations will join in their prosperity. That's a summation of chapter 2. Now, let's break it down. 
I lifted up my eyes again, and I looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand, our picture. Then said I, he's asking again direct questions. Whither goest thou? Where is he going? And he said to me, the angel, to measure Jerusalem, to see what's the breadth of it and the length of it thereof. And behold, the angel had talked with me, went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, Zechariah, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Listen, because this is powerful prophecy. Let's take it apart. Then, verse 2, following the vision of the four hordes, but still part of the same series of visions, says, my eyes see a man, verse 1. Again, Zechariah sees an angel. This is none other than the angel of the Lord or the Messiah. This is Jesus with a measuring line. Uh, here, Zechariah sees the future planning of Jerusalem in the spiritual realms as opposed to events of his day. In Zechariah's day, Jerusalem was a barren city, remember? He was trying to get people to go back and rebuild the temple. He had little hope of a future based on events in his day and the small numbers of people. Before a building project begins, measurements have to be taken. Here the angel is taking measurements of Jerusalem for the coming boom. In verse 5, a future time is described when Jerusalem will no longer need walls because the Lord will be in her midst along with a great many people. Actually looks forward to the millennium. Jerusalem today it still has walls. So this is a time when the walls are gone. It's a time when the millennium happens. And it said, in verse 12, where are you going? Zechariah engages the angel with a measuring line in his conversation, asking him in a, in a direct way, what are you doing with the measuring line? Where are you going with that line? He said, I'm going to measure Jerusalem. The angel is involved in preparing Jerusalem for her future, not just her immediate future, but her eternal future as the dwelling place of the Lord who will dwell in her midst. It amazes me that Jerusalem today you can go and visit. I've been there 50 times. And as I look at the walls and I look at the inside of that city and I see the four quarters that are there and I see the Temple Mount and I see the things that are happening, that that is the exact place that Christ is going to rule planet Earth for 1,000 years. It's amazing to me. And when I look at the walls that Herod built in 40 BC and up until Jesus' time. And then the Islamics rebuilt after the, after the bombardment and the Crusades and the, and the Muslim Turks in about 1000, BC, 1000 AD. I realized that those walls are coming down. That those walls, all of them will come down. And in the millennium, it'll be a city without walls. Anyone and everyone can go to worship and they will. So follow me as I continue to study and get excited for you and with you. In a similar sense, the book of Ezekiel also has an angel with a measuring line. In Ezekiel, the angel measures the space of the future millennial temple, where God's presence will dwell in the midst of his children of Israel forever. Zechariah, measuring line, temp, uh, outside walls. Ezekiel, measuring line, the temple. You cannot get any more clear that the Bible is one. Ezekiel says, And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass with a line of flax, a measuring line in his hand and a measuring reed and he stood in the gate of the temple. So this scene like Zacharias looks forward to the day when the Lord's presence will dwell in his temple. The angel of Ezekiel 40 verse 3 might very well be the same angel in Zechariah 2.1 since they both re represent and prepare Jerusalem for the future when Messiah will dwell in the city. As a short note, if you hear snoring in the background, it is not a man, it is our dog. <laughs> and so Cheryl's running back and forth trying to silence it. But our dog snores more than 10 men together. So please don't let that distract you. Can't you just imagine Jesus physically dwelling in Jerusalem? Think about that. Jesus physically dwelling in Jerusalem. That means if I went to Jerusalem today and the millennium was there, I would see Jesus ruling our, our planet Earth for 1,000 years, the millennium, when Christ rules. It's here that the Messiah instructs another angel to speak to Zechariah. That's the young man. And what will he tell him? Well, he says Jerusalem will be without walls. The message for Zechariah looked forward to a future day in Jerusalem's existence. In Zechariah's day, the major cities all had defendable walls with outlying towns and villages outside the walls. 
in times of trouble, people would run into the walls for safety. Obviously, the reason Jerusalem doesn't have any walls is because there would be no war. There'd be no, nobody threatening us. Jerusalem's situation was just that in Zechariah's day. A city who didn't have walls. It didn't at his day because they were torn down. No protection under constant threat. Here's what Zechariah is told. In the future, it will be, a, be the case. It's a double prophecy. Herod would build the walls in 40 AD. Jesus will come back and tear them down. They'll be gone by his day. But the Lord himself will be the defender. He will be the wall of fire, the Bible says, because the Lord will be in Jerusalem's midst. Does that not remind you? In 44 BC, about seven years later, Nehemiah led the project to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So the scene here is in Jerusalem's future during the millennium. The prophet Isaiah tells us it as we continue to interweave scripture. And said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited with towns without walls. Uh, for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I say, the Lord will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. That's Isaiah. He's the exact same words that Zechariah says. Then in verse 5, oh, let me go back this way. Then in verse 5, he says, For I, the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire and the glory in her midst. Isaiah 2 4, that's, I'm sorry, that's what it says. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. Zion shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift the sword against nation. Neither shall there be learn any war anymore. Wow. As we look at it in verse 5 in Zechariah, it says, I, the Lord, will be a wall of fire unto the end, the glory of their Lord in their midst. A wall of fire. In the future day when the city will be built without walls, the Lord himself will be the wall. You may remember that from the Exodus. In the Exodus journey, the Lord protected Israel from their enemies because the Lord became a wall of fire against the armies of Egypt who pursued Israel. Glory in the midst of we know that Christ will be a wall of fire around Jerusalem. But in the Exodus, it says this, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, and led them the way, led them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire. God is not changing his ways. He's leading by this fire around Jerusalem. He will be the fire, as he was the fire in Moses' day. Glory, it says, in her midst in Zechariah. Looking forward, the Lord himself will dwell in Jerusalem, dwell in Jerusalem with his people. Zechariah captures the scene in verse 5. According to Zechariah, the king of Jerusalem will one day enter the city on a donkey. Zechariah 9 will tell us that. 9-9. Nine, nine. He comes on a donkey and the foal of a donkey. I told you there's lots of prophecy. According to Zechariah, that's the way he'll come. Uh, the same king will rule for all eternity from the city of Jerusalem as the king of kings and the lord of lords. The king is Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know he comes back on a white horse as a conqueror this time, not as a servant who rides on a donkey. When he came to Jerusalem and they were worshiping him, unfortunately, they were worshiping him as a king, but he was not coming as a king. He came on a donkey. That's a servant. But one day he will come as a king. And actually that will start with us in the rapture of the church. Zechariah is used by the Lord to tell of Jesus in his first and second comings and of his future glory. I told you, he talks about the Messiah over and over. Just listen to some of these verses. Zechariah 9, 9, as I told you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah eleven twelve. Then said I to them, If it's agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they wait out for my wages, 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 12, 10. I'll pour out in the house of David, not the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Zechariah 9, 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion 
shall be from sea to sea and from the north from the ends of the earth the millennium Zechariah 14 6 it shall come to pass and everyone who is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up year to year towards the uh, to worship the king the Lord of hosts and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles the millennium along those lines in Zechariah 2 6 to 13 he launches us into the future glory of Jerusalem a long verses but listen to it Lo, come forth and flee the land of the north saith the Lord for I have spread you abroad as the four cor four ends of the earth saith the Lord I'm sorry that the charges is cut off deliver thyself O Zion that dwells in the daughter of Babylon for thus saith the Lord of hosts after the glory he has sent me into his nations which spoiled you for he that touches you touches the apple of his eye that's what I really want you to concentrate on for a moment today for behold I will shake my hand upon them the nations and they shall be a spoil to their servants and ye shall know that I the Lord I'm the Lord of hosts that and the Lord of hosts sent me it goes on sing and rejoice O daughter of Zion for Lord I come and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord, that's the man with the measuring hand, measuring line in his hand. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. The millennium shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. Let me stop myself. We should really listen to these verses. This is our future. This is what's going to happen. It's not an if and then, but it's going to happen. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O flesh, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Jesus right now is in heaven. Jesus will come back for us, but he will establish after seven years of tribulation his kingdom. He will raise him up, himself up, in his holy habitation. Zechariah 9, 9 to 13 says, Flee from the north. In Zechariah's day, Babylon invaded from the north. This is a direct prophecy. For Jews of Zechariah's day to come out of ba Babylon. It could also refer to a still future gathering of Jews out of the north, meaning Russia. Today in Israel, there are whole cities of Russian Jews who have immigrated to Israel from the north country. If you want to see that in your Bible, it's Zechariah 31.8 that prophesies of it. This verse applicable in the day of Zechariah also has an application for the last days. Since Judah and Jerusalem were scattered again following Zechariah's day, in AD 70, and the armies of Rome scattered Judah and Jerusalem. But after 1,850 1, years, the descendants of Judah and Jerusalem have been gathered back into the land after they were scattered. That happened in 1948, and Ezekiel 38, 36, 37, and 38, 9 foretold of it. I have spread you, the Bible says. The Lord himself was involved with the scattering of Jacob's descendants. For their sins now the Lord was calling them to return to the land he never forgot them in Zechariah's day they were reluctant because many were born in Babylon they lived in the city they loved the city they didn't want to go outside of it they didn't want to live their comfort zone they had no need to return to Jerusalem which was barren only 50,000 returned with his in 538 BC it says it will be verse 7 on up Zion the Lord urges his people to flee Babylon and return to the land of Judah and Israel. Here the descendants of Judah and Israel are called Zion. They are the descendants of Zion living in Babylon. A similar plea is repeated in Revelation regarding the coming judgment of Babylon. It demonstrates the double fulfillment of prophecy, a near-term fulfillment and then a great long-term fulfillment, which is fulfilled in the end of days at the second coming. Listen to it in Revelation 18.4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and you receive not her plagues. What does it mean? It means to come out of society, to come out of what the world's doing, to come out of the culture. There are Christians who are born Christians that are so involved in their culture that God has to give them a warning in Revelation 18, 4, to come out of your culture, come out of the sin that's around you. Don't be part of it. How many Christians, how many churches embrace homosexuality today? As if it's nothing. Yes, we love the homosexual, but we hate the sin. How many of them have gay marriages inside their churches? This is what the Bible's talking about. Just as Zechariah said to the Jews in Babylon, come out of this society. This has nothing for you. Come back to God. The same, same plea is, is given to us today. 
Daughter of Babylon, he calls. This term is used four times in Scripture. Psalm 137.8, Isaiah 47.1, Jeremiah 50.42, 51.33. Babylon was involved in the destruction of Judah and Israel. And Judah and Jerusalem and Israel. That's Babylon's involved in the destruction of the church today. As a result of the lands of sin, Babylon in the end days will be the focus of God's judgment. Revelation 17, 18. The Lord causes people always out of Babylon. The Lord has restored Jerusalem. Zechariah 1, 16 says, it says, Come now, come all you that have ears, come unto me, unto Jerusalem. He's talking about, he's pleading with his people, as I believe he's doing today. Babylon became identified with pagan idolatry and the focus of God's judgment. The people of Jerusalem turned to the gods of Babylon when they rejected the God of Israel. The woman cried for Tammuz in Ezekiel 8, 14. They offered wine and made cakes for the queen of heaven. Is it any, is it any shocking thing to you that Catholics call Mary the queen of heaven and the mother of God? Let me remind you that God has no mother. I am sure there's saved Catholics all over the world. But if you're Catholic and you understand the Bible, you got to understand there's some things that totally go against the Bible. Mary is a saint. She is pure as anything. But she is not the mother of God. God has no mother. Now the Lord calls his people out from living in the land of sin. Is he not doing that today? To return to the land of Jerusalem. This has a dual application. Again, applying to Zechariah's day and the future when the Jews are restored to the land of Israel after a long period of destruction. The Lord calls them back to the land. Right now, I am currently in the process of looking to back some ministry in Israel, big time, to be able to take care of someone who will go there and become a missionary to Israel, which they don't allow. Let's go to us today. Do you feel like you're living in Babylon today? Political money pigs and their sins? Woke America? That's absolutely insane. President's sons who have done atrocities and have not paid for them in any way. Capitalistic corporations who care less for you as much as they care for the bottom line. Weird anti-Christian groups who flaunt their rainbows in ungodly ways. It's Babylon. America and Europe and the nations that allow all of this sin without leaders standing up for what's right. It's Babylon. America is morphing into a Babylon. Zechariah continues in verse 8. He sent me after glory. Israel is the apple of God's eye. It says in Zechariah 2.8. And as adopted sons and daughters, and through the cross today, we are also the apple of God's eye. We've been grafted in. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory he has sent me unto the nations who spoiled you. For he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. Israel is the apple of God's eye. Today, you are the apple of God's eye. Zechariah 2.9, I will shake the nations. The nations which plunder the apple of God's eye will themselves be shaken by judgment. It says, then you will know me. It refers to Jesus, who right now is not known to Israel. I am coming, he says in verse 10. The Lord, the King, dwelling in the midst of Jerusalem, was accomplishing his first coming. He entered Jerusalem on a donkey, but he's coming back. In the second coming, the same Jesus who was crucified returns in glory and power to rule and dwell and restore Jerusalem. I dwell in your midst, it says in Zechariah. Jesus dwelt in the midst of Jerusalem in his first coming. He will dwell in our midst again. Zechariah 2.10 says, Sing, rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come and I will dwell in the midst of thee. I will live with you. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. That's our great revival and shall be my people. Can you imagine a world serving Christ? I will dwell in the midst of you. You will know the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And the Lord shall inherit Judah's portion in the Holy Land and shall choose Jerusalem again. Listen to this last verse. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord. For he's raised up out of his holy habitation. I love Christian worship. I love praise and worship. It does something to me. But there's a reverence that says, be silent. And this one is for the whole world. Be silent, all flesh, for the Lord, before the Lord.
for he's raised up out of his holy habitation. Can you not just see it? Many nations, the Gentile nations, will come to learn of God of Israel. They will come to learn about it. In fact, in the time of Christ, there was a court of the Gentiles, and I'm closing in a moment, where non-Jews could also enter the temple area. When Jesus was rejected by the nations of Israel, nation of Israel, the Gentile nations were grafted into the covenant blessings of Israel, Romans 11. For the past 2,000 years, the Gentiles have led the opportunity to come to the saving knowledge of the Messiah. In the resurrection, the Gentiles, along with saved Jews, will rule and reign with Christ, Matthew 25. The 12 disciples will rule over the 12 tribes of Israel, Matthew 19, 28. Each saved person will be resurrected and will participate in the millennial kingdom. You and I are kings and priests, and we will rule and reign. In that day, that day was partially fulfilled at his first coming, when the Gentiles were joined to the Lord. The verse will more fully be fulfilled in the second coming, when the Gentile nations will worship the God of Israel. They shall become my people, he says. The Gentiles will become the people of God, like the Jews. It hints at the new covenant being opened to the Gentiles over 500 years before the event actually happens when Christ dies and resurrects and the church is born. The inclusion of the Gentiles into Israel's promises occurred because the nation of Israel rejected Christ. He said, I dwell. It's the presence of God. Do you know it? Do you know it more than just being a Christian? Do you feel the presence of God inside you? Jesus Christ, the Messiah, will dwell in the midst of the city. It says, He sent me. It's the po- it's this po- at this point, Israel will understand that Jesus was their Messiah, the Son of God, who they rejected in their first coming. Tonight, as I close, and it's been a long night, I want to share one of those eight visions that the Lord had given me during my six weeks of being in a coma. Just a brief part of it. My coma started when I was, when I was intubated on February 3rd of this year. In this vision, I saw the nations of the world at war. I saw Russia invading Europe. By the way, Russia invaded Europe and the, the Ukraine 21 days later on February 24th. As a matter of fact, when I came out of my coma and my son came to me, he wanted to give me in the news. So he said, Dad, I want to read you in the news. And he said, did you hear what's happening in the Ukraine? And I said, Russia invaded it. He said, how did you know? And I said, I told him about the vision God had showed me. I saw Russia invading Europe. I saw China invading Taiwan. And I saw America on her knees, subservient to the Russians and the nations of the world. And I saw the world in turmoil. God showed me the full picture. America, Russia, China, and other rogue nations, and listen to this, you're going to be shocked, are no different one from the other. There's no difference between America and Russia. And I'm talking about secular America. I'm talking about the unsaved. There's no difference. The Lord showed me, it was very visible, that there are only two sides to this battle on planet Earth. Only two sides. Evil and Satan, who has invaded the hearts of millions, including nations, nations' leaders. He's at war with the covenant people of God. Zechariah reminded me of my vision. He told me of the Gentiles, and he told me of the Jews. Both of them he talks about as being one. He talks about the Gentile nations coming in the millennium. It powerfully reemphasized a vision I had when I was in my coma because God showed me there's no difference between Putin and Biden. There's no difference between Xi Jinping and Nancy Pelosi. These people, as far as I know, are unsaved. There's no difference. The unsaved work in unison. They work in harmony. Even though you may think they're separate, say if you're unsaved, you're on one side or the other, and Satan can use you. So he's using our nation. He's using our government. He's using Putin. He's using China and Xi Jinping. He's using North Korea. He's using everyone in every nation that is unsaved. And who are they against? They're against you and they're against me, the saved, the covenant people. And they're against Jews because the Jews are the covenant people. It's no wonder that through the years the Jews have been the scapegoat of every nation. I just finished reading a a book called Hitler, Mussolini, and the Pope. It was about Pope Pius XII who turned a blind eye to all the Jews being, being exterminated in Europe and he knew full well it was being done 
just to placate Hitler and Mussolini. It's been the Jews, they've been blamed for everything. And now we're watching Christians being blamed, even in America. It's only one fight. It's not Putin against the Ukraine. It's Satan against the, against the covenant people, the Jews and the Christians. Why? Because we are the apples of God's eye. You and I are the apples of God's eye. If you can look into God's eye tonight, you would see yourself. I would see myself. Russia and the Ukraine and China and Taiwan and America and Korea are filled with the unsaved, the unconverted. And though they think they're fighting each other, they are actually on the same side, the side of evil. Christians and Jews in those nations and other nations around the world are suffering. But remember, they are also the apple of God's eyes. We are the apple of God's eye. And Zechariah hits the nail on the head when he says in Zechariah 2, 12 and 13, The Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O flesh, before the Lord frees, raised up out of his holy habitation. Especially the last part of verse 13. So let me ask you tonight, do you feel like the apple of God's eye? Do you feel his overwhelming presence? Do you feel him rising up on your behalf, regardless of your situation? Listen, I've been through a lot in the last seven months. Somebody asked me if I ever questioned God. The answer was no. I've always felt that I was the apple of God's eye. Tonight I still do. I got some hurdles left, but God's, with God I'm going to make it. I know that. Someone asked me the other day, after I had five toes amputated from my right foot, We'll have five toes amputated from my left foot in three weeks. They asked me if I've ever been depressed at all th that I've gone through. I was quick to answer them. I have not. I've had not one depressed thought through all of this. My mind has stayed on the power and the presence of the Lord. It's easy to feel depressed. It's easy to pity yourself. But what if the Lord should come back right now? What if He told you in five minutes He's coming back? I promise you all of your depression will flee. Truth is, he can come back in five minutes. But remember, in those times you feel depressed that you're still the apples of God's eye and he's watching over you right now. God watches over me. I know that all I have and all that I am is because of God, because of his love and his compassion. And as long as there is breath in my body, I will praise God. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you that I could teach again I thank you tonight for strength that you're giving me every day. And I thank you for those who are watching, Lord. I pray a blessing on them, their family, Lord God. Tonight, may they take away from this that they are the apple of God's eye. So are their children. Lord, I pray for the unsaved children that many prayers have gone up to, for. Lord, I thank you tonight that you can gather them in as you will gather the Gentile nations. Bless us, Lord. Keep us in your care. For tonight, you may come back. Bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. I'll see you again very soon.